and then I came on board um, in the spring of 2002. So probably been here longer than most of you guys have been roaming the planet. So yeah. <laughs> Um, so when I came on, it was you know literally sort of a semi-abandoned industrial facility. It hadn't been used for over seven years, and uh, um, it was all the birds on the western flyway, all the gulls and everything, pel pelicans and stuff. Figured out this was a great place to sit. So it was it was just totally whitewashed, and so a lot of my first months involved putting up a lot of wires everywhere and a lot of washing and all that. Then we uh, immediately started on a grant process to fund the seawater building here. We were successful in that. And, uh, and then started building up our programs for bringing classes. Uh, now we've built up to, um, we have five, five boats that we run. We only have two here at the moment. One is in a class up in Laurel Bay right now. Uh, we have another on, on campus for maintenance. Um, so five vessels, we run a scientific boating program. Um, Jason, Felton, who is running the boat right now, um, is our diving safety officer. He teaches a scientific diving class, so we can train divers to work, to do university-based work. Um, and then we have the pier itself here. We can do put things over the side. We have a met station uh, where we can uh, uh, monitor local conditions, where we have a sampling device, where we're sampling uh, the ocean conditions around the clock. Um, temperature salinity. <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, the grading is, is, a, is an important design consideration. What what do you think the grading does as far as allows water to come through? It allows it to come through. It also allows it to go from the top down. So we have tremendous loading forces uh, where this grading can withstand away from above or below and, and be fine. Um, to support the grading, we have the pilings. Pier pilings are steel, and unlike your wooden pilings, which are just bound, uh, pounded into sand until they won't go anymore, um, these were actually drilled into bedrock and then oh, cemented wow. in place. So everything is cemented to bedrock, and so our what's called our vertical load is virtually unlimited. We can put almost any mass on top of this, Jeez. and we're fine. Um, where do you think the weakest part of the pier is? As far as like what we the, the walking surface, mm -hmm. look behind you, where all the cars are parked. That is the weakest. Hold on, I gotta move. <laughs> so all these big openings, like from here to here, and from here all the way out to the next beam, which is all the way over here, right there. So this whole area, you know, um, under there is just unsupported concrete. It's just a just a slab of concrete. There's nothing else supporting it. So that's the weakest. So uh, in a storm, that would actually break away and fall in. But the but the pier structure would be fine. And the buildings uh, as well. And the pilings would be fine. Yeah. We'd lose our buildings would go yeah. away. Everything on top would go away. But we'd still we'd be able to rebuild. Um, and, and our actually our evacuation plan involves you know moving everything off the pier. Um, I can I can uh, there's you'll see there's there's hatches over our our pumps that are probably in today's dollars probably forty thousand dollars a piece. We have four of them, so we can pull those and take them away. Um, so really handy. We can launch boats with a crane up here, put them in, and then we can. Uh, there's two ladders actually behind those boards. We can enter boats right there. Um, this is our dive ladder. This has been designed. We can crank that down, and it's at a right ang the proper angle where, angle where you can walk in and out with all your dive gear on. So if you're diving cool. here, you have a lot of weight on, thick wetsuits, and it's, you know, it's impossible to come up a vertical ladder, but you can go up and down that. Um, yeah, so we can, we can dive right here, um, and then we can deploy instrumentation off the pier and, and, and experiment. This is uh, all these bags right here. These are uh, uh, work with uh, Dr. Kevin Johnson, our aquaculture. He's actually our Sea Grant Extension Officer. Um, and his background is aquaculture, and he's working on uh, oyster propagation. And so there's oysters growing in those bags. Those are oysters that were started up in the seawater system with larvae, and then uh, propagated up, and then he's growing them here. He's looking at a couple different ways uh, to hold them um, and see which they, they like to grow in better. And in there, so our sand filters are quite effective. 
we'll filter down to about five to ten micron ish. Um, we'll get some single cells in there, but not not a, not much else um, in there. In fact, we have in 15 years or some sections of our filtered water lines we've never cleaned. Really? So that's how effective really? it is. Yeah. And we have wow. the same sand. Our sand wow. is 15 years old. And, it's uh, seasoned. It's seasoned. It's yeah. seasoned. <laughs> but it, it all really what it all comes down to is 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 really monitoring the the, the back flushing of your sand filters. So um, any filter will clog, and to unclog it, you have to reverse the flow. So the system's designed to do that, but the rate and duration of that back flush event is really critical, and, 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 and the frequency. Um, so if, you, if we maintain those parameters optimally, then we can maintain our sand. Um, if we're flushing too hard backwards, we're gonna blow out all our sand. If we don't flush enough, we're gonna clog. Um, if we don't do it enough, we're gonna clog. So we, we monitor all of those conditions. Uh, we can see the whole system through a, a computer system that actually comes up on our phones um, or on a computer. We can see how the pumps are running. We can see trend data on that. You know, the RPMs going down or going up. We have temperature sensors. We have uh, uh, pressure sensors. We, we control the flow via pressure feedback, not by flow meters. Uh, we have level sensors throughout the system. So probably about 40 different data points coming in. And uh, we're monitoring all those. Um, for the health of the system. So it runs 24 seven, it cannot fail. We have lots of grant related research uh, involved in this, this system. So failure is just literally not an option. But here you have a mechanical system in a marine environment, you know, it's going to fail. <laughs> and it does. And so we have backup systems. We have uh, multiple redundancies, uh, redundant pumps, um, backup generator over here. Um, and then we have the staff, peer staff, all two and one third of us um, <laughs> that are on call 24 seven. So somebody has to be on call um, and uh, and be ready to respond to the pier uh, when it Christmas, comes down. Easter, Fourth of July. Yeah, yeah, all the time. And I haven't mapped it out, but I'm pretty, I don't really want to, but I'm pretty sure if <laughs> I did, most of the responses would occur not at Wednesday at 11 o'clock. No, that's not good enough. You know, Saturday at 1 a.m. Yeah, that's a good time. Great. Yeah. So uh, it's evil that way sometimes. But um, in sea urchins are kind of like the lab rats of, of the marine environment. Um, you know, hard to say. Mice and rats, you know, they get experimented on a lot because they grow rapidly and, you know, you can get information from them. Um, so sea urchins are kind of analogous to that. Um, their entire ge genome is known. It's, they've been studied for a long time. Uh, there's papers going well back, you know, 1940s and, and, and maybe earlier about sea urchins, and there's huge literature database. So pretty much any question you have about sea urchins, you can look it up and find something on it. Uh, we contrast that to the Pismo plants, which we have over here, which there isn't even anything published on their, their uh, spawning cycle, um, a lot of basic biology, hasn't been studied, so this lab over here is having to like write those first early papers about the basic bio of, of, of the Bismo clam. It's like, really? It's like, a, isn't it like a celebrity clam? You know, everyone knows about the Bismo clam, but very little has been studied about it. Where these guys are, are highly studied. Um, so what, what it allows the researcher to do then is like take that, that database and then move forward. So what um, uh, Dr. Adams does in her lab is use these guys um, to look at perturbations to marine larval development. So when you're uh, in the ocean starting to develop, you know, what happens if you get dosed by a lot of UV radiation or even just environmental concentrations of UV? What happens if there's a lot of microplastic degradation products around you? Um, what happens if you're exposed to uh, levels of sunscreen compounds that are found around local not local, but uh, uh, reefs where people are visiting and snorkeling. So those are all different things that she looks at. Um, you can take an urchin and actually induce it at the right season, induce it to spawn. Um, just injecting a little potassium chloride into the into the, the body will produce, the males will release sperm, the females will release thousands and thousands of eggs. 
and then you can uh, fertilize those. You can mix this carbonate together, and boom, you've started life. And with these guys, at about 2.5 days uh, later, you can put a little sample under a microscope and watch them go from a single cell to dividing two. You can actually watch mm. them. You can do it in labs here. It's, it's just, it's a miracle. Yeah, <laughs> it's really cool. Uh, yeah, so then you have this wonderful, and they all do it at the same time. All the thousands of eggs in the beaker will get that time point exactly at the same time. So that's really useful. Now you can, you can take that model, you can do something to a certain batch of eggs, you can have your control, and then you can watch them over that time period. And if the, the ones that are your experimental animals don't reach that condition at the right time point, then something's wrong. So that's um, But, uh, oh, I've seen them like, maybe like twice that. Yeah, like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, voracious muscle eaters, they'll, uh, they're two feet here, they'll move around. Uh, what's kind of crazy, you know, you go out to the tide pool, and you may not see a lot of these, um, but at high tide, if you went in and snorkeled, you'd see them all up eating. And there's a reason there's banding and zonation in the tide pool. It didn't happen accidentally. It's things like these guys moving. So, you know, you think, oh, sea stars don't move. Actually, they, they, they book it. You know, every six hours, they're going up and down, cruising. Um, so the Gigantia um, keeps its back clean. There isn't, you know, most of your surface, like you look at our pier piles, there's stuff going all over it. This guy keeps his back clean with um, these special adaptations called um, uh, pedicellaria. These little, these are actually little pinchers. Oh.